Mina, your work has gotten some pushback in the, the type community. What sort of witchcraft have you been doing that's causing such a ruckus right now? Yeah, so I kind of want to start by saying that I didn't necessarily get into this for the specific purpose of being contrarian, <laughs> um, which is kind of like, you know, what you might expect from a, a dominant introverted intuitor just to be a little bit, you know, out of the box. That's kind of our thing. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that some of the pushback I've gotten uh, is sort of a result of a lot of the misconceptions that are floating around about type. Um, if you look at my work a little bit more carefully, my results, both from the, the 2017 dissertation and the stuff that I've been doing more recently, actually supports both Jung and Isabel Myers' work. Um, you know, the main idea there is that actually Isabel set up a set of two bipolar, um, two polarities and kind of stacked them next to each other. And my work just talks a little bit about what's in between some of that stuff linearly. Um, so a lot of my findings actually support Isabel and both Jung and Isabel. Um, so yeah, I think that's a lot of why I've gotten some pushback. People are really kind of invested in this, um, you know, the four functions in Myers-Briggs, this one, two, three, four, as if it's sort of like a linear timeline progression of functions that you need to develop to develop. But actually it's, it's, a, it's um, a stacking of two polarities next to one another, and that's an energetic orientation of what's happening. So I think that explains why a lot okay. of that. So you're, you're just basically like breaking some models that have been like this, like what everything's been built on? Or are you saying that I'm just adjusting it slightly? I think what I'm, so um, I think the way to say it is that I, my work is actually correcting a misconception or a misattribution of Myers's model. Oh, that, wow. You know, because Myers sort of created a, a framework that was a lot easier to understand, which sort of reduced the complexity of it and created a lot of misattributions of how the model actually works. So that's kind of. Okay. Now you have yet to publish this. It's in the works. Um, to publish it to like, um, Client facing, yes. Some of it is published in academia, um, and okay. more of it is coming. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. That's that's going to be exciting. So um, I have actually it's, it's perfect timing because there's I just did an interview with um, a data scientist. Um, he's an INTP, and he actually is, was a researcher for CAPT way back, and had knew like Mary McCauley, and it's like really way oh. back in the day had understood all the like. He, we, me and him were talking about this 50% test retest meme that keeps getting reshuffled. And he kind of explained, no one's actually read the research and it's, it's not actually that. And it's one study back in 79. And so I, I was glad to finally get that out of the way. But, you know, there are, there is a movie coming out tomorrow called mm -hmm. Persona that's dealing with, you know, um, um, Merve Emre and her work and um, personality brokers. So, it's interesting that I'm talking to you because my next question would be, you know, I want to address the, those who say personality isn't scientific. And I like to think of Scott Adams because he's, he's been typed as an INTJ and he's actually like facts do not matter. Like facts are important, but convincing people, you can't just throw, you know, um, a standard deviation chart out and they're like, well, I believe in type now. Thanks for, thanks for that information. I'm totally convinced. Like that doesn't always move the needle with people. So, um, what are we supposed to do here if you present the facts, you present the brain scans, you present your stuff, and there's like, yeah, but big five's better or something else. You know what I mean? Yeah, and I have encountered that. You know, I've had that conversation a hundred times because I come from um, I don't I wasn't raised in type, I was raised in, you know, mental health and psychology. So yeah. I've had that conversation a lot. Um, I think the first thing that is just important to contextualize here is that anytime we're working on uh, anything to do with the human experience or with the mind, what we're trying to do is put music into words and we're reducing this <laughs> infinitely complicated phenomenon into something that we can measure. If you're going to measure something, you always have to remember that the things you measure are only as good as the tools you use to measure them. And so yeah. when we're talking about empirical research, a lot of what we're doing is just researching our measurement tools, not the phenomenon itself. So it's an important distinction to make. And because of that, I think you just have to hold research lightly. The problem is that, you know, because we come from this, you know, age of enlightenment where rationality was privileged over all else, psychology is still in this very positivist paradigm mm. of cause and effect. And, you know, 
I don't think it's just psychology. I think it's like our culture as a whole is still there. And so to that, I would say that just because you can't measure it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And if you do go about measuring it, you have to remember that the map isn't the territory and you hold it lightly. The map, oh, let me think about that. The map isn't the territory. Yeah, I think that was um, Alfred, I think he has a hard last name to say, Korbinski, Korbinski, okay. I can't pronounce it, but yeah. Okay. And I have actually heard like um, personality type is sort of like um, the, 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 is a map, but then you, as you get into the cognitive function, the archetypes, you actually get closer like into the map. So it's like, there's a macro view, there's a micro view. I don't think that's what you're talking about here, but I just, I hear this map reference that comes up with personalities, like a, th like a thematic outline. Or mm -hmm. some people say it's like a house with a framework, but like you can change the colors and you can change the rooms. But generally speaking, there is a framework with which, within which you live as a INTJ, for example. Right. Yeah. Okay. Jung, Jung was actually really adamant that his model needed to be held lightly and that it wasn't, um, it wasn't sort of like a definitive uh, explanation for how the mind worked. It was just sort of this observational model that he was using to help us understand reality. And because reality is so infinitely complex, we need models to help us understand it. Um, but again, the map isn't the territory. You have to remember that it's just one way to understand the human experience. Okay. Uh, and then maybe just to backtrack a couple of steps here is that um, I'm not in the business of trying to convince people of type if they don't already believe in it. Right. Um, and what I would say is that the proof is in the pudding, right? So like you, you try something out and it works and it has predictive power, right? That's our best, our best uh, measurement of how good a model is currently. Um, and in my experience, I have found that model, that this model works as good as any other one that I've been exposed to, to understand and predict behavior and development. Right. And tell me if you think this is a good way of combating it. And I don't want, I never combat it because I'm, I'm not a scientist. I mean, I would not say that I like look at the facts and go, I'm convinced. People can be whatever they want. They just got to work hard, put their mind to it. You want to be this, you can adapt as you want it. Okay. Let's, let's take that example. And then I, and they say like, I hate the labels, the boxes. So then I say, okay, well, Mina, like describe yourself and you, you know, I think you're analytical. I think you're reserved. I, I throw, I describe you. You would say, yeah, that's me. And then, but then I say, oh, well, that, I, the way I want to classify that is um, the advocate, or I want to say that, well, no, whoa, 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 that's not, so like, we label ourselves every day, and then when we say, well, there's a framework that also says, yeah, you have all those qualities, and we call that this, there's the four letters, all of a sudden, people, like, get mad, mm -hmm. but if they were to describe themselves, they wouldn't say, I'm everything all the time. Right, that's true, I I think what you're pointing at is sort of this like polarity between everybody's a unique snowflake and everybody follows this one normative path for development. And it's just been really difficult for us as a, as a collective to find some sort of happy medium. Okay. That's my biggest thing. It's like we talk, we label each other, our friends. We're like, Oh, he's a crazy guy or he's a reserved person or he's the funny guy. What's wrong with that? So that, that's all I'm saying is like we do it all the time, but then all of a sudden it comes to type, it's like sacrilegious or whatever what is, this is perfect for INTJ because we're always looking in the future and stuff like that. So what is your legacy going to be, you know, when the research is looked back upon and people are citing it, like what, what are people going to say about what you've done for the community? I'm embarrassed to say that I, even though I think about that in very abstract terms, I haven't really necessarily defined, I have some ideas, right? But what I've found that I have more success with is just kind of letting the path unfold before me. So like, rather than trying to create some sort of end and work my way towards that, my energy just sort of takes me in this direction or that direction. It feels a lot more organic if I do it that way. But, you know, from a more like professorial perspective or professional perspective, um, one of the things that I'm really intent on creating is a model that bridges traditional Western psychotherapy and Jung and Eastern approaches to human development and consciousness growth. Um, because in counseling right now, we have that same polarity that you mentioned earlier, that either everybody's a unique snowflake and we have to reinvent the wheel with each client we meet, or there's this sort of one-size-fits-all path for human development. And so I think type is really the middle ground there is because it tells us something about these sort of different 
epistemological approaches to life and yeah. it's a shortcut almost to helping you kind of understand and you know in Jung's words sort through this welter of information about the human experience okay now you have your own um is it a psychotherapy practice correct mm-hmm. okay and how do you do you integrate do you use type as a model or do you have much a bunch of different avenues you pursue to help your clients yeah, I, I think it falls into sort of three main um, categories. One is sort of like the more technical training I've gotten in counseling and mental health. Another one is young, and then another one is just like, you know, um, I haven't really found a good way to do this, but like the integral um, consciousness development, almost like Eastern Buddhism, mindfulness stuff. Um, that's usually what I'm, I'm working with at any given time with clients. I don't actually talk about type with my clients partially because it's a very complex model to understand and explain partially because people sometimes react really negatively to being, you know, uh, typed or lost, like you were saying earlier, which again, to kind of echo what you were saying earlier is we do that in so many other places in our life. And for Mm -hmm. for some reason this, well, I think I have an idea why, but this is sort of a little bit more sensitive. Um, some clients will bring up type and then I'll say something like, oh, actually, it's interesting you bring that up. That's actually my area of research. And then we kind of launch into that. And it, now it becomes a language that we can share and talk about, which is great. Are there types you encounter in personal and professional life that you would say that it takes a little bit more adjustment to work with? Like, for example, I would say, and this is very typologically like templated, an ESTP would be hard for me to understand right away just because of the inversion of NI and SE. Do you have types like that where you're like, oh, I got to like, I got to work to make this relationship work? <laughs> yeah, totally. You mean in my practice or just in my Any, Anywhere, day? anywhere. Yeah. Uh, so just, uh, you know, a little aside here. When it comes to the work I do as a therapist, there's an absolutely a modal type that walks through my door. So there are types that I just don't get exposure to. Right. Um, so that's like, you know, if I'm answering it from that perspective, like, no, I don't necessarily encounter a lot of those types because a lot of people who come through my door and J's, you know, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, attracted to human development, that sort of thing. Right. Mm. In day to day life, I think SJs tend to be a language that I have to work kind of hard to sort of restore in my mind. Although I have to say that I find it incredibly playful and enlightening to be around them because it's just the total opposite of what I'm used to and the place that I live in, in my head. So it is difficult for me to understand. Like, I think the thing that, you know, STJ, SFJ, really like that just dedication to tradition and convention goes against everything I feel and want about like being outside of the box and doing something new and, you know, all that stuff. So like, that's the part that sometimes is like, I have to kind of do a little bit of work, but it feels so playful to engage in that kind of dynamic with someone. Okay. Yeah. That, that is my, my wife's an ISTJ and it, it works well because we like when I'm spinning off the planet doing something and then she's like bringing me back down to that. You've tried that before. It didn't work. And like, we got to, we got to do things that work and why break things that aren't broken really is good in a, in a relationship. I have found that the, you know, like I said, ESTP, but the SP temperament type, the artisan, if you know, if using the Kiersey model tends to be one I wish I was better at. I wish I could just like, think about a model in my head with introverted thinking and just like, Oh, I can fix that. I can just see it, how it works. And there are some INTJs that can do it, but I'm really bad at that. I get afraid of that. Mm. Yeah. Well, you know, just, you know, the first part of what you mentioned, the wanting to be kind of uh, model that behavior. I grew up around two SPs. My sister is an SP. My dad's an SP. Um, It has been one of the greatest gifts of my life to have that model to me. And I talk a little bit about this in my research and presentations that I've done is like putting yourself around somebody who can model the functions you're trying to approximate is one of the best ways that you can start to develop some of those other functions. Once I got into type, I started to kind of type my inner circle and I realized it's like 90% NT types. Mm -hmm. So it's like, Yes, that makes sense. You gravitate towards people that understand you, but like, what am I supposed to do to reach out to like SP types? And I did actually, I had a really good interview with a, with a gal who was blowing up on YouTube. She has a, um, her channel is called Dear Kristen and she's an ESFP. And I have never countered that I know an ESFP in the wild, but I realized talking to her, INTJs and ESFPs have the same top four stack. It's just a little bit different, but you could not 
find different types next yeah. to each other, okay. but they're not, they're not, there's, they're not like, and I basically started the interview saying like, Hey, we know ESFPs are the worst, but why aren't they the worst? And she kind of said like, why, why we're great. And it's good to like meet those types and realize, Oh, they're not this stereotype that's pervasive on the internet or whatever. Totally. Yeah. And, you know, just to plug in, like to avoid making any of those stereotypes to the greatest extent possible to honor Jung, <laughs> yeah. right? to not kind of perpetuate part of the reason why people react to type, right? You know, you were talking about like the diametrically opposed types, INTJ, ESTP. I mean, you have the, the thinking feeling, the thinking um, function in common there. But actually, a lot of what my research is showing is that paradoxically, these diametrically opposed types are actually more similar to each other and types that actually share a little bit more in common can be more opposite to one another energetically. So, you know, this is something I'm kind of exploring in the data, but also kind of more anecdotally and qualitatively, but it makes sense because it's paradoxical, right? That actually a four letter difference in type can actually have a lot of cohesion because it's magnetic, not kind of repelling or um, adversarial. Okay. So like you're, you're talking about straight across like INTJ would be ESFP. Right. Right. Okay. And all just apply to all the types. Yeah, I think so. I mean, okay. I haven't thought that fully through, but um, what I'm seeing in my research is that actually types that appear to be diametrically opposed in the 16 type model have a lot more in common energetically than, you know, types that have more similarities as far okay. as those. So. Now you're a quantitative analyst. Uh, yeah, I think that's probably the persona that I'm putting out there. I do a little bit of qualitative and quantitative work. Okay. So I have no idea what that means. Okay. What does that mean for my audience? Like what is the difference in a quantitative and a qualitative analyst? Absolutely. So in research, um, we think of quantitative as dealing with numbers and qualitative as dealing with language or words. So, you know, one way to illustrate this is like, are you going to crunch a set of data? Or are you going to do a series of interviews, collect a series of themes, and qualitatively appraise what emerges from that? Okay. That's a very uh, simplistic way to. Frame. No, that makes sense, and that's how I need it. Like, um, if you know, Einstein said, if you can't explain it easily, you don't you don't get it yourself. So that was very <laughs> good. So, basically, like, would people discount qualitative because it's not concrete? Yeah, I think the short answer is yes, although thankfully in 2021, people have started to really um, buy into the power of qualitative research. But, you know, like I said earlier, psychology is still in a very positivist paradigm where it's cause and effect and everything can be measured, everything can be quantified. There you go. Um, yeah, I think that when I've, re I've read stuff like Marie-Louis von Franz, she talks about synchronicity and divinity, and she talks about um, Jung's idea of things being like, it's a, like, there's a circle of events that happen, and then there's like, they all converge to like this happening. And the problem with like empirical thought or like kind of from Newton, who was an INTJ, mm -hmm. like you can, everything's a linear process that like that A equals B equals C instead of it's like, not like that. So that's why we, when we can't explain something, we just go, no, we can't. It's just actually this, which we're trying to quantify the like esoteric that can't be. And we have to be okay yeah. with that. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And, you know, it doesn't also doesn't mean that you can't engage in, you know, the endeavor of trying to, right. It just means that you have to be really, A, you have to hold it lightly. B, you have to make sure that the tools you're using to measure are as accurate and sensitive as possible. Um, because, you know, like you were saying, we can only re understand reality by reducing it in, into these formal sets of knowledge. And when we are measuring, we're really measuring our ability to measure. And so that's kind of our way into like finding some kind of empirical um, understanding of a phenomenon that really just can't be put into words in its full reality. Right. Okay. I think that's, that's like kind of an awesome way to like end this where it's just like, that's where we're at. Like we're, we're getting closer, but like, in, it's like, as you get closer to zero, you're still not, you'll never get to the final thing. So it's like, yep. Is that, that's get there. Paradox, I think. Yeah. So, um, Mina, I appreciate you coming on the show. I've been extremely um, excited for this. I have to thank, you know, uh, Dario for making the, the intro. There would possibly no way I would have known about your research and, um, 
like how to find you without him. So always, always thank him. So um, appreciate the time and I will be getting, I'll put all the links to find you. Um, you know, if people want to like book a session with you, I know you have, you can, you do sessions. So um, I'll put that in the, the comments here, but I really appreciate you joining me today. Yeah. Thanks Joe. It's a pleasure to be here and thank you to Dario and all of my mentors. Um, yeah. So the, obviously yeah, I, I'm taking clients. Um, there's a couple conferences coming up too. If people are interested in kind of getting into the research part of what I do and I'm always happy to just have a conversation about anybody, um, about anything, uh, type related or human development related. Perfect. And I will put, um, all that info in the comments so people know how to find you. Excellent. Cool. Thank you. Thanks, Joe.